All right. So welcome back. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about hard mass production and systems. It's just something I've worked with quite a bit. And I think it's important for you to understand how important genetics are in wildlife management, how important they can be, even when you're talking about managing habitat. So uh, when we were talking about those timber stand improvement and those regeneration techniques like the shelter woodcut that we would use in oaks, those do not take into account at all the mast producing potential of trees. And you remember when I was talking about a gene in a population, how that has a bell-shaped curve, right? The same thing holds true in mass production for oaks. So we should expect, you know, this distribution of that gene. On average, all of the, you know, most, many of the producers are average producers, but there are individual trees in that population that are going to be excellent or good producers, and there are other ones that might be moderate or poor in that population. So here's that bell-shaped curve that I'm talking about right here. If you actually look at the mass production, I actually measured this and counted thousands of acorns while I was doing it. <clears throat> Hunt, uh, probably hundreds of thousands of acorns actually. And uh, when all was said and done, when I was looking at these populations of white oak, about 50% of the oaks were poor producers. So uh, basically this line right here, all of these would be poor producers. And what I found in that study is that that 50% of the trees, notice 13% uh, and 18% were excellent and good. That's that shaded portion that we're talking about of the population. <clears throat> so the left half of the graph is poor. The shaded part is the excellent and good. The 50%, that left side is only producing about 15% of the mast. Look at the excellent, that shaded portion. Those trees are producing almost 70% of the mass. That's pretty substantial. So let's think about that shelter wood cut for a minute. We, were, we would go into a stand and the, the idea is just, just to maximize space. So we would be retaining oak trees in the overstory that might you know, they, they might be poor producers or excellent. We're not taking that into account when we're implementing that shelter wood cut for timber, uh, you know, timber management purposes. It's just not something that's taken into account. But if we could figure out which trees are in which class and then implement a shelter wood like harvest where we remove half of the trees, you remember the poor if we could remove that poor, we could maintain 80% or 85% of the mass production by cutting down half of the trees, which is pretty incredible to think about. And uh, in the long-term study that we just published on this, uh, <clears throat> we figured out that because this is a genetic trait, there wasn't anything about the tree. It didn't matter what the canopy position was, how big it was, the size of it, the form of the tree, anything you could look at at the tree did not matter in terms of whether or not it was a good producer. But if you track production for three years on it, then you could basically assign it to good or poor. And the reason is poor producers in most years do not produce any acorns. And some trees literally just don't ever produce any acorns. Like they're, you know, they're a mature oak tree that, that, uh, you know, has the capability. It is reproductively mature, but for whatever reason, genetically, it just doesn't have the genes, right? It doesn't produce any acorns. So that tree is a very little value from a wildlife standpoint. Uh, the, especially wildlife that need those acorns to be produced. So that would be one we would want to cut down, especially since it may be one of the high quality trees that we, uh, <clears throat> you know, that has a lot of value. So if we could design, <clears throat> you know, a, a harvest where we could maintain those excellent producers, but remove all the, the uh, poor producers, we might actually make more money on the stand and also increase production. If you track them for three years, it turns out if the tree produces an acorn, just one, if you can prove it produce, if you can prove that it produced one acorn in two of those three years, then it automatically is on the right side of the distribution and it's one that you should retain if you're doing uh, the cut for wildlife pro, uh, 
uh, purposes. So that means that we could literally follow uh, acorn production for just a few years and you know landowners pretty commonly already know which trees produce and which ones they don't especially if they're hunters uh you know they know which ones the squirrels are getting in or the deer come get under or turkeys or whatever they already know which ones produce mass some years so those would automatically get marked and then if you go out with binoculars and just look up in the canopy about this time of year during you know uh during october and look to see do they have acorns on them or not and if the answer is yes then it gets a, a mark on the tree so uh, the other interesting thing that you might hear about a lot related to this is uh, the idea that you should fertilize those producers. And I just got done publishing a study that was a long-term study with hundreds of oaks where we went in and fertilized some and, and uh, released the canopy of others by killing trees around the canopy to allow it to expand. And uh, fertilizing did not have any measurable effect on the production of acorns or the sweetness of acorns or any of those other things that you might have heard about. Fertilizing oak trees for mass production is just not practical and it doesn't have any measurable uh, effect. And we did that study for 10 years with hundreds of oaks. I mean, it was pretty solid that uh, fertilizing doesn't work. Okay. Uh, but canopy expansion ha makes a big difference. So think about if we cut down 50% of the oaks and they were the poor producers, the canopies of all of those other oaks, those excellent producing oaks that are on the right side of the distribution, their canopy will rapidly expand to fill that canopy gap around them. And that would actually uh, result in mass production of the 50% of remaining trees would supersede the entire stand when it was at 100% trees. The 50% trees would overtake production of that stand in just two years, which is pretty incredible. So you could cut down half of the trees, make all that money off of it, and potentially increase mass production, not to mention sunlight is getting to the ground and allowing all this uh, plant community to respond and you get that added benefit. So a uh, pretty cool practice for you to think about and uh, sort of a, a new hot off the press idea uh, for how we could manage oak forests. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to show you some of the latest research and, and for you to think about uh, variations on some of these techniques that we can use to manage uh, for wildlife. Appreciate your time.